whether you guys are dating, married, uh, happily or unhappily married, uh, remarried, whatever your situation is, hopefully this is going to be something that's going to be really helpful to you. So uh, for coming out, and uh, I remember we attended our first marriage conference about 28 years ago. Uh, Teresa and I have been married, as, as the little intro said, for 30 years. We dated for four years. So we've been together for 34 years. And some 28 years ago, we basically said, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> but we don't have to remain ignorant, right? We can go and get help. So we attended an event. It was actually at the Hilton Hotel here in Jackson. We had just moved here from Memphis. And uh, that event was Friday evening, all day Saturday and half a day Sunday. So, but it, it put us on a path where a couple of things, we were like, hey, you know, this is really great information. And then the second thing was like, man, this is what we want to do with our life. And, and also I was thinking, uh, I didn't really understand. I wasn't really taught that there was a model for marriage um, coming from scripture. I mean, it, it just wasn't what we were taught as a, as a child. So I didn't have that model. Even it, though my, my, my family were Christians, I didn't see how a man should treat a woman and, and what God said about it. I didn't have that mindset. And here's another thing that you, I don't know if, me, if any of you had to fight this, but when we told our friends that we were going to a marriage conference, this is what they said. Oh, we're so sorry. Yeah. And we're like, you're sorry about what? It's like, we thought you, we didn't know you all were having problems. Exactly, exactly. Well, two <laughs> things. One, I already know everybody is having problems because you can't put two sinful people together and not have problems. That's the first thing. Number two, the fact that we're going to the doctor doesn't mean we have cancer, right? So, so again, I, I, I don't know if you guys dealt with that, but uh, we want to hopefully remove some stigmas attached to attending events like this. It doesn't mean you're on the brink of divorce. Hopefully there are people here that, that have great marriages. They want to go back to your community and learn to equip others in your community to have great marriages. There are people here that, that maybe are struggling in your marriage right now. But I promise you, the way we're going to lay this out, the way that has been put on our hearts to lay out with you guys, is going to be extremely helpful. Right, and, and hopefully you are doing a checkup in your relationship periodically anyway. Going to a conference, taking a, going to a retreat periodically. Just to uh, reiterate and rekindle those fires. Exactly, exactly. Now, you're going to notice some differences in our styles. We, we've kind of, um, you know, Teresa is the clinician, right? You know, she's the, the master's in marriage and family therapy, the thousands of hours of, of counseling and being trained. You know, she really prefers to sit in the conference room across from you and your spouse, where I don't particularly like going in the, in the counseling room. Uh, I do on occasion, but I really like speaking to an audience like this, I, uh, I like to make it a lot of fun. I know, unfortunately, hopefully we're going to change this, many, many men were drug here. <laughs> you know, your wife's registered, you know, she insisted, so we hope to make, by the time you leave, you're like really, really glad that you came. Okay? All right, so let's, let's look at some things about marriage. Oh, wait just a minute. Okay. Some of the men might not have been. I'm going to say that. I'm going to go with the men today. Some of you might not have been. You, you were proactive and you were like just honey this is what we need to do so i'm gonna give you all some we're not gonna beat you all up too bad i i, I noticed in, in, the, in the counseling center you know i take most of the phone calls and and these are some things that i've noticed 98 percent or higher of the phone calls are from the wives hey we want to schedule an appointment and then the two percent of the time that the guy does call he's usually like my wife said she's not coming back unless, <laughs> unless we do, you know, so, so, so I, know, I know that's not everybody's situation, but, but guys, I'm telling you, it's no shame in reaching out for help. It's no, I, 28 years ago, I said to my wife, we need to go do this. So, you know, I, uh, I, I hope but by the end of the day, you guys are going to be really glad that you came if you're not already glad. <laughs> so, you know, you always hear about the negative statistics about marriage. So let's kind of just start out with uh, the reports of the death of marriage have been greatly exaggerated. And just here's some interesting fun facts we thought we would share. So 85% of the population will marry at least once. Married people live longer than unmarried or divorced people. 
Married people are happier than single people or widowed or divorced or cohabitating people. And that's, that's the results of where the study came from. Married people have more sex and a better quality sexual relationship than do single, divorced, or cohabitating individuals. And, and when right, we get you to, don't have the guilt. Exactly. And when, we get to that, <laughs> and when we get to that section, married people, this, you know, there are a bunch of little taboo topics. You know, we normally present in church settings, and there are a number of little taboo topics that often people don't talk about. So, but here's another thing, just like we know that people are having problems, we know that people are having sex. So we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about God's plan for married sex. And, you know, kind of the differences in our style, we moved here what, 87 from Memphis. And we're from, uh, Teresa's from Shannon, Mississippi. I'm from Dorsey. She's a graduate of the uh, Mississippi University for Women. I'm a Delta State grad. And we're from little small country churches, you know? Uh, and so we moved here and we're at this really big place. <laughs> and so much like this morning with, with many couples, one morning on the way to church, we had an argument. And so I am, I am just by nature real touchy-feely. I, I hug. I like sitting next to her. I like, we're just real touchy-feely. But that particular morning, since we'd had an argument, when we got to church, there was space between us, right? So we're at this big church here in Jacksonville, big city, and, and Teresa says, uh, hey, she leaned over in church. She whispered to me, hey, put your arm around me. People are going to think you're mad at me. <laughs> and so again, guys, this is just this is just how I am. This this it didn't have to think about it. I am mad at you. <laughs> I was mad at you when we got here. I'm mad now. I might be mad when we leave. I, I'm just not good with pretending. And so you know, we 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 want to be extremely transparent in everything that we're going to talk about. Okay, some just some other facts. Uh, married people are more successful. Children from homes where the parents are married tend to be more academically successful. And, and, and that's truly be, uh, mainly because of the foundation that you're, you've created. You've given them confidence in their world. Exactly. And so they don't have to focus on, on where my identity or anything. I've got that settled. So now I can focus on my studies. I can focus on other things. that it, I don't have to deal with that foundation where we, broken homes, at, sometimes a child is focused on how is, how is mama feeling, how is daddy feeling, and stuff like that. And that interferes with studies. And so if you embrace the statistic that 50% of marriages end in divorce, and, and I'm, there's some questions about whether that's exactly accurate, but, but using that fact, at least 50% of all marriages don't end in divorce. So we, we hear a lot, people, we don't want to get married because we're doomed to fail. That's not the case. Uh, I mean, marriage is, is a great thing. Now, there are some things that we need to talk about, though, because marriage is under assault, Okay. So there are some successful tools that you're going to need for a successful marriage. So let me kind of set the stage with how this is going to work. Uh, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to use something that, that uh, actually Rome and I talked about months and months ago. When, when we did, uh, where's Annalise? When we did Rome and Annalise's premarital counseling, we talked about that you've got to get the heart right. And guys, this is where we're going to start today. You've got to get the heart right before you can get the head right. Okay, so I was telling Rome this, it kind of all starts internally before you can go externally. And so the thing I like working with younger people is that this is kind of how he conceptualized it. You know, I said to Rome, here's the thing, you've got to get your vertical relationship right before you can get the horizontal right. He said, oh, I got it, I got it. So you've got to get this right before you get this right. I said, man. That's, that's, that's exactly right. So now when we see each other, we don't have to say anything. It's just when he does that or that, we know exactly what he's, what he's talking about. <laughs> so the, that's kind of where we're going to start, right? We, you know, to, to talk about your relationship, your marriage being unbroken, we got to go back and talk about how did it get broken, and it is broken, and then how are we going to repair the break. So this is, this is kind of the illustration we want to give you. Uh, and I, I can I can be kind of long with this could be like a three day event, but I know we're I know we're only here to five. So 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 uh, um, Teresa and I several years ago took our entire life savings and we left our jobs or I left my job at, at the time the business that I was in and we started a real estate investment company. 
And since I, Teresa says, I tend to do things, what do you say? I don't know how to like gradually do stuff. I intend to do it in a big way or not be, at all. Has to be really big, yes. So here's how we got started. We bought 70 houses. You know, not seven, not 17. <laughs> we were bought 70. And grew that to a company with 20 employees and, you know, literally bought hundreds of houses over the next few years until it all came crashing down and we lost everything. We tell people we went from owning over 100 houses to losing our personal house. Mm -hmm. but, but that's not the story I'm telling right now. Uh, but here's the thing I learned in that business. Often when you would go to assess a property to determine how much you could pay for it, and that was based on how much you could sell it for and based on how much work it needed, right? So we would go in and we would see cracks in the sheetrock. And so I would bring people out to do assessments, and some guy would say, hey, this is just going to need some caulk and paint. You're good to go. You know, it's going to be a $5,000 rehab. And another guy might come out and say, hey, this is going to be a $15,000 rehab. And I would go like, wait a minute. You know, this is I'm just learning. This other guy just said $5,000. Well, here's the difference, Jim. The first guy thought you had a paint problem, and what you really have is a foundation problem. So... Until we get our foundation solid, you can't patch that up enough to make it work. Does that make sense? You know, because if you patch it up, shortly it's going to be just like it was. And so it is with our, with our marriages and our relationships, for those of you who are, who are not yet married. I mean, until you get the solid foundation right, nothing else is going to work. So what we're going to do today is talk about how to get the foundation right. So let's go back to the beginning to see how things got broken. Now, now here's what you're gonna notice. You, no, go right ahead. Okay. To me, this is fascinating stuff. I mean, I mean I, 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 this is fascinating stuff. So, when you look in, in the beginning, here's what you see all through scripture. The Lord God said. The Lord God formed a man. Now, the Lord God planted a garden. The Lord God made. You follow me, Genesis 2, all the way through 15. Through 15, the Lord God commanded. The Lord God said. Now, this, this is fascinating to me. Okay, then, you know, the Lord God made a woman. Now, Lord means master, ruler. It's not the same as just saying God. It's Lord God. Okay? Now, now follow what happens here. Follow what happens here is when Satan shows up, when Satan shows up, this is the first thing he says. This is the first time you hear him speaking, and this is very important. Did God say? Now, wait a minute. He, he left something out. Because so far, it's always been the Lord God, my master, my ruler, my Lord. But Satan obviously had rebelled against that authority, right? And so now he's asking Eve, did God say? And, that, and if you read scripture, you know, you got to really read it closely because you may just skip over that. But it's so, so important that Satan actually left that out. So did God really, this is Genesis 3, 1, did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? And, and by the way, notice this, Satan didn't show up until after they were married. Now, Father, that, that's very important, very important. Um, is this making sense so far? I mean, so here's what Satan is saying, and this is where we are in America right now. It's okay to keep religion, just don't have a relationship. You see, the, you see the difference. I think I mean, you need to say that again. It's, it's, <laughs> hey, Satan is not against religion, but he's against you having a personal relationship with Christ, and that's the only way this is really going to work, guys. We're, we're going to explain that more later, but but it's very important to note that how he left out the Lord God. Um, now here's some other things to notice. Uh, this I'm telling you guys, if you want to figure out how this got broke, or is it broken? It's fine. Whatever. Okay. <laughs> so, so if you want to figure out this got messed up, it's important that you look at this from the beginning. So here's some things to notice. Satan, these are, these are not by accident. Satan intentionally went to the woman first, not the man. Okay, now there are a number of reasons. Okay, Satan is powerless as long as we are fully submitted and working in God's order. But when we get out of order, you follow where I'm going? So what did Satan do? Let me go around. Okay, I know what God did. Man, the head, the woman, the men over the earth. Let me try to undo that. So Satan immediately goes to the woman. On purpose, he reversed the roles. 
He reversed the roles. Okay, so you got Eve, who was supposed to be under the leadership, headship of the man. She began to lead. Okay? Man becomes the passive responder. And guys, why is this so important thousands of years later? Because it's still happening. So here's what basically happened. Hey, Adam, eat this fruit. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I mean that, that's, basic, that's basically what happened. That's basically what happened. So his response was, yes, dear. Basically, it was yes, dear. So, so now, sometimes I say yes, dear, and we're going to talk about that in a second, so I'm about to jump ahead. Uh, okay, so before the fall, you got male leadership. It's noble, it's honorable, and as far as the woman was concerned, it was personally gratifying and not terrifying. Okay, does that make sense? But now, here's some things about God that you will notice when God shows up. He put things back in order. So he didn't say, E, first, he didn't say, E, what's going on? He didn't say, Satan, what are you doing? Here's what he said, Adam, what's up? Because that's how he organized things. Now, this is, this is why it's so important, because we repeat the same mistakes over and over again. Now, if you remember what Adam said was, and this, this, is, this is deep, because Adam said, the woman you gave, this is what Adam basically said. Hey, Lord, I was, I was, everything was, before you gave me Eve, that's when things got messed up. <laughs> that's basically what Adam said. I mean, the woman you gave me. So Adam denied the responsibility, right? Now, here's something I find interesting. Um, and I know some of you already know this answer, so, so just, just hold your response. Um, where was Adam when the serpent was talking to Eve? You know, usually when I ask this question, most people say, off working, or I'm not sure where he was, but he definitely was not there. Okay. Go. When the woman saw, Genesis 3, 6. When the woman saw that the fruit was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She gave also to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Okay, so now, guys, this is deep. So Eve is conversing with the serpent, and Adam, as Scripture reports, was standing right there. Genesis 3, 6. Present but passive. Now, now you know, we all have tendencies, right? We all have natural inclinations. Now, this is what I believe. I, I wasn't there, but you know how you put yourself in other people's position? Now, typically, a man after the fall, has a tendency to either be passive, we're going to look at that in a second, yes, sweetheart, whatever you say, sweetheart, or domineering, okay? Those are our natural sin natures on both extremes. Now, my tendency, many of you are going to find this surprising probably, but, but <laughs> my tendency, my natural tendency is to be more domineering. And this is what I tell people I believe. Just how I'm built. Now, I know that I'm sinful, so I may have eaten the fruit myself, but I'm real good at pointing out what Teresa shouldn't be doing. I believe, had I seen it, you better put that fruit down. <laughs> you know what God said. <laughs> now, 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 again, I may, honestly, I, can, I may have fallen and eaten it myself, but I just, my natural tendency is I like telling other people what to do. Does that make sense? You know, so, so anyway. But, but I, I find that fascinating that Adam was actually there but didn't say a word. Okay? So here's also what you notice about the fall. Now, this is important because we're talking about how things got broke. Then we're going to talk about how things are going to get unbroken. Uh, this is interesting because the fall happened uh, serpent to woman to man. And then I find it interesting that when God came back, he put things back in order, man to woman to serpent. That's when he started handing out the punishment. So we've already talked about when, uh, you know, where Adam was while Eve was talking, Genesis 3, 6. Mm -hmm. Okay. Teresa already read that. Now, this is an interesting verse also because this is where we see the key to fixing the break first start this is actually, when you go back and do your research on Genesis 3.15, this is actually the first time we hear about the coming Messiah. Okay, so this is, in this verse right here we're talking about, the scripture's talking about, I will put enmity between you and the woman, 
and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. So Jesus is actually going to ultimately triumph over Satan. He will stri- you will strike his heel. There's the whole crucifixion. There's going to be pain and suffering. It's all part of the plan. But I find it interesting that in Genesis 3.15 is when a plan is first kind of outlined. So as we continue to walk through this, this is also another crucial, crucial, crucial verse. To the woman, he said, I will make your pain in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, labor, you will give birth to children, and uh, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Okay, now, if there is a man, see this crowd, you look like you guys have already read this stuff, but but normally when I ask this, uh, most men think this is a good thing. My wife is going to sexually desire me. No, that ain't. That, well, well, here's the thing. In the middle of handing out a curse, God doesn't mix in good stuff. Okay, here's your punishment. Oh, go get some candy. Y'all follow what I'm saying? That, that's not how it works. So, so when it says your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you, this is what we see happening. There's something about Teresa when she acts like her natural self that makes her desire my position, the head. There's something about her when she's acting not like Christ, maybe not y'all's wife, but, but makes her want to be in charge. If, if you I know y'all can't say anything. If you could say something, have you guys seen that? Okay. And then there's something about me that makes me not to want to lead like Christ, but want to leave in a dominating kind of manner. This is important. Why and how and when did that happen? Why is there conflict in your marriage, in every marriage <laughs> since the beginning of this time? It's right here. Genesis 3.16. Okay, so, so here's, here's what, guys, once you understand this, much like Jesus said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't really talking to Peter, he was talking to Satan. Okay, so when Teresa comes to me with things that are different than what God has proclaimed, you know, now depending on what, I wish, I wish, uh, I wish Charles was here. Uh, uh, you may not, you may or may want to say, I realize this is not Teresa naturally, but it's something behind her, <laughs> someone behind her. And so here's what I'm saying, guys. Once we realize where the attack's really coming from, it's from the enemy who's seeking to destroy our relationship. He's, I mean, that's his mission to rob, kill, and destroy. So it's not, here's something else I learned at that marriage conference in 28 years ago. Uh, my wife's not crazy. And, and I'm not the enemy. And you're not the enemy. Now, and I'm, I'm not your enemy. I went there going, one, I think she may be crazy. <laughs> and two, I'm not sure if she's, a, think if she's the enemy or not. But the thing about going to events like that one, and of course at that event, it was probably 800 people there. Yeah. Um, I, you know, hey, other people are having these same issues. And, and then it pointed out to me, which I didn't really understand, the differences in men and women. Right. And in, in, in any relationship, whether you're having struggles or whatever, you have really the same problems. It's just how you choose to deal with them. Uh, we, we, I mean, some of the ones that are on brink of divorce, I might have that same issue. I'm just choosing to look at it differently. Exactly. So the first part of the day, we're going to talk about how did this get messed up? How do we fix it? Then we're going to move to some real practical tools for coping. But we're starting here because you can't get this right until you get this right. Does that make sense to everybody? That's where we started. Okay. So uh, here's another thing I find interesting that... uh, that uh, as a result of that, we've already talked about Adam's sin unleashed the class of female disobedience and the destructive curse of male domination. The fall or the curse unleashes the woman's rebellion to the headship of man, and man, st- instead of leading, now has a bent to dominate. So, you know, and, and there are several things you guys go back and study. If you look at, uh, I don't think I put this on the, on the slide, but the word desire is used again in Genesis 4-7. Uh, when the Lord says to Cain, uh, sin is crouching at, the, at your door and it has a desire for you, it's the same word. Just to, just to reinforce that, that's not a good thing. Okay? 
Now, here's another interesting thing. Uh, Genesis 3, 17. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. This is what's about to happen. Now, notice something very important here. Is God against me listening to my wife? Exactly, exactly. Because my wife is my help meet. Now, th but this is how I would maybe amend the answer a little bit. Is God against me listening to my wife? It depends. Okay, let me give you some examples. See, see if y'all remember this one. Hey, this is what I would do if I were you. I would just curse God and die. Anybody? Who said that? Job's wife. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Now, that's not, that's not something Job needs to listen to, right? As, as a matter of fact, if you notice Job's response, which Job, Job was a perfect and upright man. You can tell that by his response. This is what Job said. I think this is Job 2.9 and 2.10. So Job's wife, hey, all this stuff is going on. You should just curse God and die. This is what Job said. Now, now notice the difference here. If you read, I wish I put it up here. You talk like a foolish woman. <laughs> and that's very important. See, some of y'all have said, you just foolish. <laughs> see, <laughs> see that? That's different. <laughs> y'all see? You see how Job responded? There's a difference. <laughs> There's a difference. So, so Job said, you talking like a foolish woman. So speak the truth in love. Exactly. That's where we need to be. Exactly. <laughs> so, so uh, okay. So we've talked about the break. We've talked about the consequences of the break. Genesis 3.6 and Genesis 3.16, mm -hmm. those things are crucial. Um, we talked about that desire was not a good thing. It certainly does not imply sexual desire. Her desire is to contend, contend with him for leadership. And, it, and it's a just punishment because think about what happened. Think about what happened. How did we get here? What was Eve doing leading? What was Adam doing following? So this is, this is basically what God said. So because you had a desire to lead, okay, this is going to be your punishment. You will desire for leadership, but your husband is not going to rule over you in a dominating way, which is, not a, which is not a good thing at all. Okay, so in your, in your manual, not our real manual, but the manual that we wrote, not the, not the Bible manual, that would be the real manual, but let's, let's go to page 97. Okay, so we're going to talk about the, the last we're really, part of it. We'll just go ahead. Go ahead. Rigid, everything that we've talked about is laid out on page 97, so when you get home, you can read it in greater detail. Right. Um, but you see that we have two natures. Two, thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's one where we're picking up there. All right, so we have Adam's sin nature. You see that in the middle of the page. And then Christ's righteousness, which we can take by trusting him. The amount of conflict in a marriage will govern, be governed by which man we tend to act like. So, so in my natural self, I am selfish, mm -hmm. not selfless. Um, in my natural self, I'm more on the 50-50 plan where I'm keeping score. We're going to look at this in greater detail later as opposed to acting like Christ, which is completely giving with no expectation of receiving in return. <clears throat> now, you see why this is so important in a marriage? Because if I'm keeping score in the marriage, I'm, I'm going to always feel like I'm doing more. I mean, it's just, it's just your natural sinful nature. Yeah, the selfishness about us. So, um, so again, we, we're not going to read it to you, but, but on, on page 97, we kind of walk through this. And here's what we see. Uh, that you're also going to see on page um, 98. 98. Moving, yeah, as we, as we move to page 98. But I want to talk about this first. We see a silent man when he was told to be the leader. As a matter of fact, guys, here's what I find funny. Before this part, Adam just talking, 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 talking. Because he's naming every animal in the world. <laughs> Cow, buffalo, goat. He's talking, 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 talking. Now, when all of humanity is hanging in the balance... He's silent. But anyway, let's, let's, let's move on. So, so we see a silent Adam when he was told to be the leader under God's authority. We see a subversive woman when she was told to be submissive under the man's authority. And we see the serpent Satan, the deceiver, who's the only one of the three acting like he's supposed to be acting. 
I mean, I just I find it fascinating. He is always on his game. He, he's the only one in order <laughs> doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing. Um, so <laughs> this is where marriage became broken. And it's so, so important that we, that we talk about that and understand that because we're not going to fix it. Now, Teresa, I think, is an excellent, excellent counselor, okay? Uh, she's got thousands of hours devoted to being a counselor. But while she can give you tools and techniques, and her approach, by the way, is to work on the heart, well, right. what is your approach when somebody comes in? Um, first, I, I don't... Just in case you're not where you are in a, um, from a spiritual um, a area or you're not as mature or whatever, I don't start in that area, but that I am always working. You've come to a Christian counselor. By the end of that first session, I am going to say, you've come to a Christian counselor. Let's talk about your faith. And we're going to uh, I let them know that we are going toward that direction because, and if there's something we need to talk about, uh, if you don't understand something, I'm there to help you understand it. Um, and there are some who reject that, and that's okay at that point. And I'm, I'm going to give them the tools they need to deal with whatever situation, communication, conflict. I'm going to give them some tools. But still, by the end of our few weeks together, that will come back up, and I will look at that because that is the only way you're going. I tell them you cannot... Uh, expect to have God's ordinance, which is marriage, and leave him out. He is a, he has to be the major part in that relationship, or it's not going to work. It's not going to work uh, the way he has designed marriage, and um, that's, it's his ordinance. So I, I give him that. You know, you know, here's what I find interesting, uh, the, the book that you have only came out a couple of weeks ago. And by way of promoting the book, we started by giving the book away. And we gave away over 14,000 copies of the electronic version of the book through Amazon. It, it was, you know, and you might think, well, that's, that's not that big of a deal. But just because you're giving something away for free doesn't mean people want it. So the fact that 14,000 people actually Download downloaded it. the book is an amazing thing. Then... We started gradually moving the ebook up, you know, from free to sale, sold, or, or what am I trying to say? From from free to where it was there was a cost That's for a cost. it. Mm -hmm. We moved up to ninety nine cent to two ninety nine, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but here's what I found interesting: you know, we had three book returns, and here was the thing: we didn't know this was a Christian book. Who returns a ninety nine cent book? <laughs> <laughs> Who does that? I mean, we had three people. I, hey, now, now, I will tell you this, though. Here's what I will say. Hey, take a stand. You with me or against me? I mean, you know, you can't be lukewarm. So, I mean, I, I guess I do appreciate that. Hey, we don't want no Christian stuff. And they sent the book back. I mean, I, I, find, I find it. So, Teresa made me think of it when she tells the story. Because, obviously, just like we're talking about now, that's the basis for everything we do. Because we don't believe that you can have, you can be married but not be married right without following the instructions from the very inventor of marriage. You know, that's, that's what we kind of talk about a lot. So because of the curse, you know, Genesis 3.16, there will be a clash between husband and wife. So, so this is, you know, back to the part about how did we get to this point. I think it's important that we understand this. Uh, conflict is a tactic orchestrated by Satan to destroy your marriage and your family. Okay, now look, looking in page 98, I want you guys to look at this. Um, what are three purposes of marriage? I don't know if you ever really thought about it, but, but there may be more, but what are at least three purposes of marriage? Okay, so on page 98, we talk about <clears throat> procreation. Now, here's the interesting thing. We have four children, but the thing is, is not to make little people to look like you. Even though they do. Even though they do. <laughs> even though they do. Some of us, that's good. Some of us is bad. You know, but anyway. Uh, so so uh, uh, the, the idea is to make image bearers for Christ. Does that make sense? So, so that's one of the first purposes, procreation. So now look at what Satan did. So by diverting and diluting your walk, 
you know, it destroys your marriage and family or can destroy your marriage and family. And once you've destroyed your marriage and family, one of the purposes is kind of thrown by the wayside, procreation. Okay, what's another one? Sanctification. Okay, so it diminishes your witness. Okay, now think about this. Think about this. Have you, well, this is, let me ask this question. Have you ever thought about this? One of the reasons that oftentimes I do stuff that's extremely irritating to Teresa, I just thought about this. I'm helping you. Is, <laughs> is, is, I just thought about this. Is to sanctify her. Okay, make her more like Christ. Are you, guys, you kind of familiar with the, uh, the, th the three stages of our redemption, you know, first of all, there is justification. Mm -hmm. I have been saved from the penalty of sin. Okay, justification. There's sanctification. I am being saved from the power of sin. So every day I should be getting a little less irritated with the same old stuff. Every day I should be becoming less like me and more like Jesus. So oftentimes conflict in marriage is to sanctify me because you can't get better without there being some growing pains. Does that make sense? And then, of course, the third stage, glorification, I will be saved from the very presence of sin. Let me go back to sanctification. Okay. Um, I, I, I talk about... Uh, showing grace uh, in in the relationship because if you can look at yourself or you know the things you do um, and then you look at your husband and you're more irritated at those things and you think okay I wonder what does God think about me I know he loves me but he shows me grace and that's what I want you to see and do that for your spouse show him grace show her grace we, we, we don't have it all together, and we don't know it all. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so when it comes to sanctification, if you will just stay, because we, we see, we, by the grace of God, Teresa doesn't have a lot of stories where couples came for counseling and divorced. Obviously, that does happen. But she does have stories of <laughs> literally people who got divorced and remarried. Uh, so, so, I mean, God has worked through that ministry in a tremendous way. But the thing about sanctification, sometimes if you stay and pray, you will grow instead of going, if, if that makes sense. So, so I mean, sometimes <laughs> we, we actually did a study once that was, what if God designed marriage more for your holiness than your happiness? So, so I mean, just think about this. I mean, some of the things that... And back to that conference, when I saw other examples, I was like, man, that's the same thing we just went over or went through. And then I started realizing, hey, maybe I need to grow. Because now my first reaction, I know not any of me here, hey, my wife needs to change. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but as a result of understanding and growing, I started seeing Hey, you know, I'm, I'm probably part of the problem. As a matter of fact, man, speaking of that, um, you know, the reason that God set things back in order when he approached Adam in the garden, Adam, what did you do? Uh, is because this is another thing that, that we teach in a different setting, the responsibility. See, see, most men are comfortable with the idea of headship and authority. Hey, I'm in charge. Yeah, we're going to do it like I say do it. But now, I read a book, I don't know, 20 years ago. I read a book by Stephen Farrar called Point Man. And here's what that book said to me. Jim, you know you're the authority, you're the head, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Jim, do you understand that also makes you responsible? Wait a minute. Wait, wait, what? Yeah, so whatever is happening in your house, Jim, you are responsible but I didn't, even, I didn't even mess it up. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but the way you are responsible. Now, it's not always something you caused, but I, I'm just saying that kind of as an aside to the men. I'm extremely comfortable without being taught of being the authority. I had to learn to be responsible or comfortable being responsible. You know, and that's, that's kind of a different thing. 
Okay. So uh, let me see. Can we do a devotion? Oh, we're, we're, we're running a little bit ahead. So a couple more things I want to mention. Um, so conflict is a tactic orchestrated by Satan to destroy your marriage, and it affects procreation, sanctification. Oh, I didn't cover the third one. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so this is important. So divine illustration is also one of the purposes of marriage. It should mirror, or for the public at large, here's a relationship like Christ has with his church. So you got Christ sacrificing, you got Christ dying, you got the church evangelizing, you got the church being salt and light. This is how this should work. So it also messes up that because we hear this all the time. Uh, based on what we see and know about marriage, we don't want to get married. I mean, why would we get married? I mean, we have not seen any or many examples of a great marriage. So it also messes up the divine illustration. And this is something that we want to encourage you guys to do. Um, as you are and we are growing ourselves, we want you to reach back and bring others along with you. So whether that's going back to your local community and your church and saying, hey, let's start a marriage and family ministry here, or whether you already have one but you want to get involved and enhance it, whether you want to share resources and get other people excited about the whole thing about marriage. You know, they're, they're just, I, I've gotten now where I'm just really, and I know I, I, I'm in this ministry, if you will, but I'm really sensitive about people talking about marriage. You know, when people say things like, hey, there, there comes your wife, the old ball and chain. You know, <laughs> you know I, I mean, I don't, I don't even laugh at that anymore. I mean, I, I, don't, I really don't. I really don't. And, and here's something that happened, and I know this is going to be, I'm a, I, I, tend to, I do tend to be a bit extreme. Yeah. So we're at the, at the <laughs> <laughs> did you just agree? I did. Oh, okay. So, so, so. I speak the truth. I, I, see, I, see, I see you working. I see you working. <laughs> but, but, you know, just, just things that, that when people say those things that maybe are a bit cliche-ish, I, I take the, the time to say, okay, hey, that's not how this works. I mean, go. oh, I was just going to say, not only uh, you should be careful how you say things about the, the, a marriage is because, like he said earlier, the children uh, are watching, they're hearing, they're listening, and they 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 can sense conflict. They can sense things not being okay, or uh, it's you know it's out of order. Children can sense that as early as three years old. They know. Something's not quite right with mom or mom or dad. So I was just I was just thinking, uh, watch how you talk and say things about marriage because you we, we do want to keep our generation going. And if we uh, get away or leave marriage out, then that's going to have a great effect on our our generation to come. So we just want to recap. So we talked about how things got broken. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Hey, your wife husband is not crazy. This is just the result of the fall and the conflict that ensued after the fall, right? Now, so now we're going to talk about when we come back, how do we manage and ultimately get to a position where that break can be repaired? 